Uh, I now want to bring up our next guest. Um, Yusuf Beg is the uh, California Voices editor for Cal Matters. This is a commentary section that we have that he has revamped and turned into a place for ideas. Welcome to the Ideas Festival, all about California. And he's going to uh, bring up his special guest and introduce somebody who probably needs no introduction in this town. Yusuf. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, so, Daryl Steinberg is the mayor of Sacramento, as probably most of you know, for just six more months, actually. Uh, spent 14 years in the legislature, including uh, leadership roles as President Pro Tem in the state senate. Uh, while in the Capitol, he authored the Mental Health Services Act, uh, which the governor this year reformed as Proposition 1. Uh, I want you to please welcome the most respected policymaker of his generation in California, and I think uh, a leader of the city will miss Daryl Steinberg. Thank you. Thank you, man. Yeah. We chose to, to take our jackets the off. The comfy couch, I, I won't lay down. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about, like, the, we only have 20 minutes, so I really yeah, want yeah. to jump in. I mean, the, the tension between state and local governments right now has really ratcheted up in recent years. We've seen unsheltered homelessness get worse. The public is demanding action. Newsom is, you know, threatened with holding funding if there was an accountability. I, I guess, um, you know, when you were a legislator, a legislator, what was that dynamic like? I mean, what do you make of the, the rhetoric between the state and local governments today? Well. I actually think it's not as bad as maybe it appears. I mean, Governor Newsom and the legislature have been champions of this issue. I mean, I, I say this about the governor, and, you know, no politician that I know of is perfect. Uh, none of us are, and neither is the governor. But he's the first governor in my 30-plus years who's made mental health and homelessness a priority. And he's backed it up with real funding. And, and, um, and we've worked collaboratively. When I was chair of the big city mayors, we recognized that all of the money goes through the counties. And I often joked that when I, had, when I wrote the Mental Health Services Act back in 2004, if I knew that I was gonna run for mayor 12 years later, I might have written it a little bit different because all of the money uh, goes to the counties. Um, and, and so we got the first direct allocation. We advocated for it, got the first direct allocation to cities which has made a huge difference in our city. In Sacramento yesterday, big headlines today, 41% decrease in unsheltered homelessness. It's not a dec yes, thank you. It, it's, it's not a declaration of victory in any way. There's still 6,000 people on our streets. And yet, it affirms, in my view, that if you set a vision and you stick with it, and you kind of filter out all the, the noise, including the political noise, you can make progress. I know we'll talk more about that, but the governor has been great, the legislature has been great. Now they have a deficit. And so the governor has proposed not funding HAP. The big city mayors are who, are, who are his allies are saying, we'll always be allies, but we disagree with you. Mm. And we're fighting to restore that billion dollars and the legislature's put it in the budget. And now very few people are in one small room with a couple of spreadsheets and they're trying to figure out how they balance this budget and I hope and I believe that HAP will be restored because for us, that 41% gets wiped away because this is the money we're using to fund homelessness and our, our additional beds. Um, cities, and this is you know so basic but we often forget it, cities are not homeless service agencies. We're not mental health agencies, we're not substance abuse agencies. And yet, the majority of the problem is in the urban core. So all of us, all of the big city mayors, um, have been required by just definition to lean in like never before, and we have. Well, I, you know, like talking about sort of the, the way it seems in the public sphere yeah. between the state and localities, right? Uh, as Cal Matters reported recently, the governor promised in March last year 1,400 tiny homes yeah. for Sacramento, three other cities. Those haven't materialized yet. There's still some finger pointing and in, in the reporting that our my colleague Marisa Kendall did. And so, I, yeah. I, you know, what what should the public, I guess, take away if that sort of adversarial sort of posture is still what's permeating the discourse? Well. 
I think maybe what you take away is that there is a big difference between policy making and implementation. Uh, the policy making is not easy, but it may be the easier part when it comes to government. Because what's really at issue is how to deliver what the people want, need, and expect in a more timely way. And the tiny home story is, is one story among many, but I know part of the frustration that I've had between the city and the county, and by the way, our relationship has improved pretty dramatically over the last couple of years, is that implementation to me sometimes is too slow. It's like there are people out on the streets. Why aren't we intervening faster? Why does it take 90 days to assess somebody who's obviously living with severe mental illness and substance abuse to enroll them in a full service partnership program. And um, I think that's where the rub is. I, I think that this is odd because I, I, I love the League of Cities and Carolyn Coleman, great, great leader. But, you know, they don't invite me to all their conferences because they think as a mayor that I would subscribe to this idea of local control. And I think local control is grossly overrated and overstated. I want the state. I thank you. Yes, you I, I, I want I want the state to hold us accountable in real ways. I want the state to require cities to not only plan for more housing and affordable housing, but to actually mandate a production standard. I, I think local control has its place, um, but it is way too overstated because what it says in the end, well our local preferences aren't nearly as important as the fact that thousands of people don't have a place to live. If housing production is the number one priority, then the public policies ought to weigh much more towards that than, than saying you can have many reasons and excuses to not approve a housing project. That's the way I feel, so that's why I don't get invited to those conferences. <laughs> Well, you mentioned, too, that, you know, the relations with the county have improved in recent years. The district attorney, you know, filed a oh, lawsuit against the city. That was a were, very... I knew you were going to bring that well, up. Well, no, because I, I think, you know, tell, tell us really then, how are, how's the relationship with the well, county? This is the services provider in this region. If this is what's happening in the capital city... Yeah. Well, this is all between us, right? Um, so... Um, so, this issue's gotten political. And I'm the mayor, and I, I made some mistakes myself, I will admit. I think every good public official needs to admit it. Um, and my mistake was coming in with a ball of fire as mayor of Sacramento with limited power and setting a very high expectation and, say, and saying, we're going to move the needle on homelessness. And in fact, the results from yesterday show that I have lived up to my promises, but oh my God, what pain there has been along the way with a worldwide pandemic and uh, a housing crisis and the limited tools that I have as mayor. No excuses, but that's just a fact. So it's gotten political. The business community in this town, not all of them, but some of them put the DA up to suing the city, <clears throat> not the county, but the city. Um, and and uh, I, uh, have tried to react, uh, not take the bait, so to speak. We've defeated his lawsuit because it was frivolous. And here's what I say. When it comes to this complicated, difficult issue, do not, and you're a policymaker, do not follow the shiny objects. Do not think there is an easy and simple solution because guess what? That lawsuit, the, the initiative that the business community uh, put forward requiring us to enforce and add capacity and all that did not create a single shelter bed. That lawsuit did not create a single permanent supportive housing unit. That lawsuit did not create a single set of services for people living with severe mental illness and substance abuse. And that lawsuit did not even break up an tent encampment that was causing a health and safety concern for the neighbors. In the end, the only thing that matters is the work. It's the work. And if you're willing to persist through the ups and downs and not give up on a vision, and by the way, our vision has been to build capacity, more temporary beds, more permanent housing, 
give people a choice. More people are taking the choice, by the way. 84% increase in the number of shelter beds since 2020. 30% increase in permanent supportive housing, and they're all full. So more people are saying, yes, you stick with that, and you'll begin to see results. Because this is complex. And fundamentally, and you'll hear from Dr. Cushell in a moment, I know, this is about economics, and it's about poverty, and it's about people who are fragile, who have once been able to hang on, who now are fragile and are not able to hang on because the cost of living has outpaced them and the cost of housing has outpaced them. So it's a serious, it's, as Michael Douglas said, it's an American president, these are serious times and it requires serious people. And if you want to be part of the solution, then help us build a bed, help us create a program, help us divert more people from prosecution to mandatory services. I'm okay with that. But politics is politics, always has been, always will be. I'm a politician who chooses to focus on the work, and we're beginning to get results. I want to touch on just enforcement. Yeah, go ahead. You can clap for that. Thank you. Go off, Daryl. Go off. Yeah, I got, I got a few friends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have also at least seen, you know, the visibility of homelessness has created a bit of a backlash in a lot of communities, yeah. right? And in the absence of uh, maybe visible progress from all the state funding that's been expended, you know, we're starting to see local, local governments pass these uh, enforcement first sort of uh, measures. Uh, right now, the Supreme Court is writing a decision in the grants pass case that could potentially overturn Martin versus Boise. I'm curious, yeah. um, say the Supreme Court overturns that decision, would you like to preserve some of the protections? within the Martin versus Boise president, or would you be okay with a rise in enforcement? I think we all know, or at least expect, what the Supreme Court is going to do over the next couple of weeks with Martin v. Boise, that they are going to overturn it in some way. <clears throat> I'd be surprised if they didn't. And I think that would be a mistake. I think it would be wrong. And here's why. Martin v. Bo the flaw in Martin v. Boise is that it wasn't specific enough mm. to really try to differentiate different contexts, but the underlying theory of Martin View of Boise, in my view, is absolutely correct. This is what it is. I'm going to simplify it. Government, society through its governments should have a legal obligation to help people who are on the streets find dignified shelter, housing, and the services they need. In my view, that ought to be a legal right. I've been touting that for a long time. And I'm either dead wrong or way ahead of my time. I'm not sure what. But until it is a legal right uh, or a legal obligation for government to provide it, I think governments are going to go at their own pace um, and, and not be as effective as if it's compelled. At the same time, I believe that people should have a legal obligation to accept that help when it is offered. Because the public policy of the society needs to be that nobody lives in these tent encampments or in these unhealthy situations. That's what Martin V. Boise, I think, meant to say, needed a little refinement and specificity that, that rights and responsibilities go together. Unfortunately, with this Supreme Court, I think they're going to just throw it all out, and some cities like ours, will do our best to maintain that fidelity between rights and responsibilities. Other cities may not, and I think that would be unfortunate, because if you're going to solve this problem by just moving people from one street corner to another, then I think you are uh, providing false hope to the people you represent. Yeah, you mentioned some of the the point in time, time count numbers that came out this week. I want to dig into those. Can I just do it again? <laughs> 29% decrease in homelessness yeah. overall in, in Sacramento County, 41% in unsheltered homelessness. Uh, it was met with a lot of skepticism. Service providers who see these choke points, you know, yeah. what people are accessing, uh, what people like us see on the streets when we're walking out, it, the visibility is increasing. Um, you know, say it's, it's not accurate, but it's in the right direction, that there is some decrease. What are the forces then at play here? Well, the underlying numbers really tell the story, and I referred to it a moment ago. Between the city and county, we have dramatically increased our capacity, our beds. 84%, as I said, for temporary shelter and transitional housing, 30% for permanent housing. 
but that's not all. We've organized ourselves differently. We now have a Department of Community Response that uh, is intended to be an alternative to law enforcement that's out on these streets and these encampments every day. And we have a legally binding partnership agreement with the county, which is as close as I could get to a legal obligation that I spoke to earlier. We are now required by law with the county to be out in 2010 encampments a month to intensively evaluate the status and condition of people. And the county is then obligated, and this is written down and it still needs some lifting and some life. The county is responsible for doing, quote, whatever it takes to help people from the encampment to shelter, housing, and services. And that's now a legal requirement. And what it's done, even if it's not perfect, is it has changed the culture between the city and county. We're now working together. And we are working together at staff level, even at the elected official level, things are better. So I would say it is, we are organizing ourselves differently within the city and more effectively. We are partnering with the county. We are, um, and we are using the state uh, investment uh, the HAP funding and the Mental Health Services Act and all the other funding, including the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Fund, which was one of my bills back in 2014 that's generated billions of dollars for infill housing. Uh, we're doing all, we're, we're escalating and elevating that in pretty dramatic ways. And we're giving people a choice. And so I know perception goes many ways. Some people say, well, the perception's worse. Some people say the perception is a little bit better, that um, the encampments are not as large um, and that um, the problem feels and seems a little bit better. Even in downtown Sacramento, they do their own internal count. They say they're down 27 percent from May of 2023 to May of 2024. So that's not 41, but it's at least uh, close enough for for the discussion. I want, you were mentioning earlier just kind of the, the structure of government that you stepped into. We've talked about this yes. a bunch. Oh, yeah. uh, I wanna just kind of get into like the cost of showing leadership on this issue in California. I mean, you took over uh, a, a weak mayor system here in, in Sacramento. It's not like a handful of other cities like LA that uh, maybe an executive directive would just be immediately implemented, right? You don't right. necessarily need uh, the council to move. It, this has made you kind of a poster child for yeah. progress or failure on this here. I mean, how would you assess you know, your work now that you're kind of well, in the final close I, I, of it here. I said yesterday, only half jokingly, that I only need as much credit for the 41% decrease as the blame I've received for the last seven years. So if it's, if it's equal, it's all good. Um, <laughs> and I, I think that, um, like I said, I think I made my own mistakes. I, I, I had been gone from local government for uh, 14, 16 years, because I had a sabbatical um, in between for 16 years. And I thought I could come in and not rule the day, but I thought that um, everyone would sort of be on the same page as me. And the real conflict, to be honest with you, is that city, this freak, this whole homeless thing has really freaked out cities because cities are municipal service corporations. What they're used to doing is collecting the taxpayer dollar and providing basic public services. Public safety, police and fire, 80% of our budget, pick up the garbage, maintain the parks. I mean, the core services. So when a guy like me comes in with my history with the Mental Health Services Act and, and with a lot of ambition, and I see a real problem, I'm pushing very hard uphill. And so in the early years, even though we overcame neighborhood opposition, we started building shelters, we built this capacity. I mean, this all happened over gradually over seven years, it was really, really tough. And the relationship with the county was hard because nobody likes being dictated to, or at least perceived that they're being dictated to. I didn't try to. I'm actually a pretty collaborative leader. I mean, I, I, I don't need, really don't need the credit. I like to share it. But it was tough. There was tons of resistance. And that's the culture uh, a little bit in the city and in local government. But again, there's politics and there's lawsuits and there's initiatives and there's frustration and there's yelling to the, howling to the moon. But if you stick with something, it's what I believe about politics and public service on every issue. You're either in it for the long haul or you're not. 
you either stick with it and you, you adapt and when you have to go a different direction, you do it. But if you know that building more capacity, more beds, more services for people is the absolute predicate to helping people and morally and legally telling people that you can no longer stay in this particular encampment, then you continue to build that capacity. And that's what we've done. So people can say, well, the numbers aren't right. But the underlying numbers back it up because what is an 84% increase in the number of shelter beds over the course of four years that are full? That means more people, by definition, are coming inside. Daryl Steinberg, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That was great. Yeah. That was fast. Yeah.